Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to today's post-budget press conference hosted by Premier and Minister of Finance, the Honorable E. David Burt, JPMP. We will begin today's press conference, conference with remarks from the Premier. Premier. Uh, thank you, Ms. Adams. Good afternoon, uh, Bermuda, and good afternoon to members of the media. Thank you for joining me today for this rescheduled post-budget press conference, which I am conducting remotely. I wish to assure the public that I'm feeling fine and I intend to conduct most of my engagements this week remotely, including the rescheduled Chamber of Commerce budget breakfast and the House of Assembly session this Friday. I look forward to returning back to the office next week to continue the work of progressing the government's agenda. For the last few years, the government has been focused on the parallel task of keeping the people of this island safe and laying the foundation for Bermuda's economic recovery. In record time, we set up the unemployment benefit scheme to provide the safety net for those who could not work. And in addition, introduced a policy that allowed foreign nationals to work from Bermuda and invest in this country. Each of these endeavors yielded positive results within our community and within our economy. The 2022-23 budget moves Bermuda from the closed, restricted approaches brought about by the pandemic and promotes an openness that signals a return of tourists by both air and on cruise ships. The reignition of our tourism industry will support the return of jobs for Bermudians and also positively impact local businesses with increased economic activity and will also greatly benefit government tax revenues. The budget also represents a clear intention on the part of the government to strengthen Bermuda's prospects for economic recovery by extending relief across the board for hardworking families, employees, employers, and charities who played such a vital role over the past two years. This relief includes a further reduction in taxes for those making under $96,000 a year. And this is the third such reduction since this party was elected in 2017. And in this budget, there is no increase in payroll taxes for those making $96,000 or more. What this means is a person making $48,000 a year would have seen a total of a 68% reduction in their annual payroll tax bill compared to 2017. And they will pay $720 this year, which is a reduction of $240 over what they would have paid last year and a total uh, reduction of total reduction down from $2,280 to $720 this year. That is a significant reduction in taxes. Those persons would have seen their payroll tax burden decrease by $4,920 over the complete time that the Progressive Labor Party government has been in office. And that is something that is significant. Moving on, this relief does not extend only to payroll taxes. The government will also reduce private uh, car license fees by 10%. And we will continue payroll tax concessions for hotels, restaurants, bars, and nightclubs for their employees and their employers for at least the next six months. We will provide land tax relief to our nursing homes and charities through amendments to the Land Valuation and Tax Act. And in addition, we will extend the supplementary unemployment benefit until the 31st of August, 2022. And there will be a further extension of the voluntary pension withdrawal for a further year so that individuals who may need to withdraw an additional $6,000 may be able to do that during this year. This relief highlights our commitment to reducing the tax burden on Bermudian families and businesses as we continue our economic recovery. The government has been able to provide this relief because we maintain disciplined public sector spending, and due to the fact that our revenues are $31 million higher than we expected during this current fiscal year. And that means that our revenues that we're expecting are $31 million higher than we predicted at the beginning of this fiscal year. And as we continued our discipline practices, we will also look at ways in which we can continue to support Bermudians across the board. One of the concepts of which I raised the budget statement, as I said, that there's relief now, but there will be more relief later. And if our budget picture continues to improve, we will return 50% of the excess revenue to taxpayers 
in the form of reducing our duty on fuel. And this is important because it will impact energy prices. Fuel duty was raised by the former government by 110% during their time in office. And we are not going to wait until the next budget cycle to start providing some relief in this space. Quite simply, if more tax dollars are coming in than we expect to come in, we will save some of that to reduce the deficit, but we're going to return half of that to the taxpayers of this country who need relief, especially in the area of higher energy bills. And this relief will reduce energy bills for consumers at home and also for businesses. The goal of a balanced budget is an important one and to one that which this government has committed to seeing through, just as though the government, the PLP government was the first government in 20 years to deliver a balanced budget projection in 2019. The budget statement spoke about what happened in 2019, and we don't have to relive the issue of Morgan's point. However, we did balance the budget before, and we will commit to balancing the budget again. Though the balanced budget has been pushed out for one year, it is vital to recognize that balancing the budget on paper would have meant significant cuts to critical services to the public and an unacceptable level of job losses in the public service. I spoke in the budget statement about the cuts that would have been required to police, fire, prisons, many of the helping agencies in order to meet an artificial budget balance timeline. We have extended the budget balance timeline out a year but the important thing to note is that the government remains ahead of its debt projections due to strong revenue growth and discipline spending constraints. And this means that our debt that we forecast to accumulate last year is the exact same as the debt that we expect to accumulate going forward. So there has not been an increase to our debt projections, and we believe that we can extend the balanced budget out by one year to make sure that we have a smoother uh, trajectory to return to a balanced budget without significant disruptions to private service, public services, and to ensure that we can support economic recovery by investing in the things that will bring future growth to this economy. Our disciplined spending and human-centered approach to economic recovery means that relief for the people we serve is provided where it can help. Behind the numbers within this 22-23 budget are real people, and the impact of the slightest reduction in the tax burden is something that we recognize, something that we're committed to doing, and something that we will continue to do. Families are budgeting down to the last dollar, and it is the government's responsibility to always have an eye to what will positively impact working Bermudians' households. Beyond tax relief, this extends to funding education reform, healthcare reform, and getting on with the work of the Tax Reform Commission. Over the next few weeks, ministers in the House of Assembly and junior ministers of the Senate will delve into the details of individual ministry budgets. There will also be press conferences with ministers so they can speak to the finer points within their various ministry budgets. The government team will have an opportunity to set out how each area will play a role in the social renewal and economic recovery. And I'm confident that the people of Bermuda will see the hope represented by the 2022-23 budget and the potential for growth and economic recovery that it provides. Before I close my introductory comments, I'd like to say a brief word regarding the situation in Ukraine and any potential impact on Bermuda as it pertains to the Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority and the Bermuda Shipping and Maritime Authority. In response to the Russian military invasion of Ukraine, many countries, including the United Kingdom, have introduced a wide range of sanctions against the Russian Federation. Once implemented, UK sanctions are applicable in Bermuda as Bermuda is an overseas territory of the United Kingdom. The Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority is responsible for the safety and oversight of aviation in Bermuda and all aircraft on the Bermuda Aircraft Registry. There are approximately 900 aircraft on the registry of approximately 740 are utilized by Russian air operators. The majority of these aircraft are owned by leasing companies based in Ireland. The leasing companies require jurisdiction with unquestionable rule of law and a judicial system to enable collections in the event of default. And that is why Bermuda is their jurisdiction of choice. The Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority is carefully reviewing sanctions in coordination with other stakeholders to ensure that they and relevant entities with 
which it regulates are in full compliance with the applicable sanctions while maintaining its safety and its oversight obligations. While the Bermuda Civil Aviation Authority continues to review its sanctions, there is no question that the number of aircraft on the Bermuda Aircraft Registry utilized by Russian air operators will be greatly impacted. I'm not able to provide any specifics at this time. However, updates will be provided as the actualities of the sanctions come to light, and the Minister of Transport will be making a further statement to the House of Assembly either on Friday, March 4th, or Monday, March 7th, on the latest in this regard. Thank you, and now I'm happy to take questions from members of the media. Thank you, Premier. This uh, round of questions will come from Mr. Gary Kelton of the Bermuda Broadcasting Company. Good afternoon. Yeah. Just start my video. There we are. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Premier, and good afternoon. Now, first of all, for former finance minister Curtis Dickinson said in November that he wanted to meet targets at this budget ahead of refinancing almost a third of our $3 billion debt this year and next. Chamber of Commerce President Nathan Kowalski says we need to maintain credibility in our ability to balance the budget. The bu this budget isn't meeting those targets, 7 million lower on this year's deficit estimate, but 30 million more for the following two years and balancing the budget delayed another year. All this has the potential to impact our credit rating and our ability to negotiate on the refinancing of our debt. Why are you delaying steps to directly reduce the national debt? Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, let me start by saying that, yes, it is important to make sure that budget targets are met. And so if we look at what we have been able to achieve, this year we have met the budget target of $125 million in deficit, whereas it is coming in lower, as you mentioned, at 117 million. I think it's also important to note that last year, we exceeded the target that was set. It was originally set at $245 million in deficit, and it came out at 185 million. So that is $68 million below the level of deficit spending that we expected to be. Now, as the fiscal responsibility panel said, and others would have recognized that the budget this year did contain a number of one-time measures. Those one-time measures were not carried over. And so in order to meet the spending target that was originally set at $896 million, it would have resulted in serious uh, cuts to the public service and also support that was given during this period in time. That was thought as something that was not able to be achieved in this particular year. And so I want to make sure that we look at the fact that we've hit these targets, but I think it's also important to take into account of the full window. Last year, we said that we would incur, and it's stated inside of the budget statement, uh, that we would incur $410 million of deficit spending before we made it to a balanced budget. And this year's budget projects that we will, uh, we will have $405 million in deficit spending. So it is actually less than what we predicted next, last year. So though there is a more gradual glide path and not a severe glide path, it's important to note that the total amount of borrowing that was projected last year has not been increased at all. In fact, it is reduced by about $6 million. And so it's important from the economy's perspective that if we do have additional revenue, recognizing that reduced taxes in the economy does provide support for economic activity that would return some of that money to taxpayers. And that is what we've done. So I do accept that the balanced budget target being pushed out for a year is a measure for concern. But in our presentation to ratings agencies and in our presentations to the markets when we go to refinance our debt, we can speak to the fact that the total targets of debt accumulation have been beat. We are not falling behind there. And we're able to show where that money is coming from and to show where our where, where our deficit targets remain uh, the same. Okay, Mr. Premier. To note, you did say that it came in, the 2020 uh, uh, amount did come in far lower than expected, but 
even though we did better than worst scenario estimates, uh, 2020 was still 164 million bigger deficit than was predicted to be pre-pandemic. Um, few will be taking into account figures for 2020 globally. What is, wouldn't that be the case? Is it true the international community will be looking at how we are managing recovery now? Absolutely. I think that the bond, uh, the ratings agencies and also our investors will be looking at how we are able to manage the recovery. And the fact that our revenues are $31 million higher this year than they were last year, the fact that we've been able to, by and large, keep a handle on spending. We haven't seen any increase the size of the public service, despite the fact that we've had to take on a number of temporary employees to, uh, to maintain uh, the coronavirus pandemic response. All those are things which are looked at the picture, but I think the most important thing to recognize is that the government is not anticipating the targets which were laid out in the economic recovery plan, which were published in the House of Assembly, the targets which were laid out in the last budget, and the targets which are set at this budget. We have not exceeded the amount of total deficit spending that we expected to have after the pandemic. That number was 411 million, and now that figure is 405 million. Yes, we could have not reduced taxes this year and made that figure higher. Yes, we could have done other things that would make those numbers come into balance. As I said inside the budget statement, we could have had a balanced budget next year. It would have meant not doing tax cuts this year and also keeping in place the travel authorization fee. There are many different levers of which you can pull and adjust, but I think that it's important that the government continue to press along with its long-term plan and not be held to short-term views. Balancing the budget on paper is fine, but you have to ensure that you support the economy that exists. And so I do not actually believe um, that it is, how would I say, I will just say a balanced budget with no safety net is irresponsible. And we can help to promote growth um, and we can help people simultaneously. Yeah. Well, my second question would be that um, the budget extended new higher relief aimed at international businesses and large local employers. Bringing in high earners in IB is a fast way to increase growth and payroll tax income, but is it uh, realistic in the short term? Um, international laws are being rejigged. Could this make IB tread carefully when it comes to hiring? International business uh, wants to make sure they have a stable jurisdiction from where to operate. And the record of the Progressive Labour Party government is supporting that stable uh, jurisdiction in which to operate. As we've seen, international business has increased the amounts of persons that are working in Bermuda over the last two years. It's been about a 10% increase. So during the pandemic, where we've seen a lot of a decline in certain sectors, the budget statement makes it clear that over the last two years, there's been a 10% increase in the amount of jobs in international business. And I think what's important to note is that last year, uh, the amount of new jobs that were created, there were more uh, new posts created for uh, persons with Bermuda status than there were created for a guest worker. So we are making strides in that regard. Yes, the international tax agreement does in some way, shape or form provide a, um, a headwind or level of uncertainty. But from the Bermuda perspective, we've always been able to navigate these tax changes. We will recall when I was Minister of Finance in 2017, there was the view and fear of the U.S. tax changes at that time and the impact that it will have on Bermuda. We've gotten past the impact. Then there was economic substance, the impact that that would have on Bermuda. We've gotten through that because Bermuda's calling card is our stable uh, political environment, our certainty of policy making, and I think it's also key to note and this is one that's critical, is the Bermuda Monetary Authority and their international standing. And so as we've seen the expansion that has happened in whether it's the digital asset space, the expansion that has happened in this space when it comes to international business insurance, especially our long-term insurers, we're going to continue down that path. It's important also to note that the new higher relief was brought in under the Progressive Labor Party government in 2018 in our first budget statement. And it is now being extended because we've seen that it's been successful. And what we want to do is we want to increase the amount of persons that are living and working Bermuda. That has been our position since 2018, and that is continuing. So we do not believe that that new higher relief um, is something other than, you know, what we've set out in the past and extending it, we do not believe is in any way, shape or form a negative. We think that's certainly a positive to the international business community. Finally, we were told to expect a hard budget, but it turned out softer 
than many expected. With a parliamentary majority of 30 to 6, you can make bold moves, even unpopular ones. So why no new taxes? The, I do not believe that the people of this country need an increased tax burden at this time. Um, I certainly don't believe so. I think that our tax, our system of taxation um, inevitably falls on the workers of this country. We have committed, and in our election manifestos and what we spoke about, we were in opposition when I was shadow minister of finance in reducing the burden on workers. And we have demonstrated that we have reduced the burden on workers. If you are trying to uh, stimulate an economic recovery, the last thing that you do is to raise taxes. Yes, it is a tough budget, Gary. And I say it's a tough budget in the perspective that all ministers have had to go through a very difficult process of reconciling spending priorities. And there are going to be some discontinued programs and reductions in grants in order to meet the strict budget targets, which were set out by the Ministry of Finance. And so from that perspective, you know, there are some difficult choices we made. I mean, in the perspective of tourism, there's been some reductions um, in the grants to the Tourism Authority. There's been reductions in certain grants that are going in certain places. I mean, these are the difficult things that have had to be made clear. But I think that what you do not want to do is to increase taxes when the economy is weak. And what we have committed to doing is to provide further um, relief. Yes, it is a difficult budget because we have difficult things to contend with. We have the difficult things to contend with with our demographic challenges, and we have the difficult matters to contend with it, getting ourselves a balanced budget, holding the line on spending, making sure that we make the economy more efficient, and also uh, dealing with our long-term issues with the unfunded uh, liabilities in our pension funds. So there are difficult choices that must be faced by the Bermudian public. But I think that it's important to recognize that ministers have had to have a very difficult time over the past four months, paring down their priorities, making sure that we look at what things may need to be stopped and things which may need to be continued in order to meet this budget. Because there were a number of one-time measures which expired this year. And so there's been a significant challenge in making sure that the government's priorities can be funded in this particular budget. And ministers will certainly outline those matters as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Thank you. Gary. And Gary, appreciate. as you know, if there's more time, we'll certainly come back around. So I look forward to it. I hope to return. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Premier, the next set of questions will come from Mr. Sean Connolly of the Royal Gazette. Hello, Sean, you're on. You're on mute, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Connolly, you're on mute. Mr. Connolly, can you hear us? Hi, can you can you hear me? Sorry about that. It's just a bit of a glitch. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, um, good afternoon, Ms. Mr. Premier. Um, I hope you get better soon. Um, uh, the, um, the budget on Friday, um, you announced that there would be cuts to public services, but you didn't give any details of where they will be. Um, sorry. Um, people... People are very concerned about that. Um, they've been left in limbo since since Friday. Um, I know you said that you'll leave it to your ministers to announce them, but people are worried about um, the situation. Uh, obviously, your finance minister, you know where the axe is going to fall. Um, can you tell the people today where the cuts will be? And if not, why not? Um, thank you. Um, I will try to find inside of uh, the statement of where I spoke to the difficulties um, in uh, the uh, budget. Um, and I don't want it to be seen when we spoke about a uh, warning for cuts. I know, understand that was the headline of uh, what was given um, in the daily. Uh, but there are some difficult choices that have to be made in order to meet our spending targets. Um, I've outlined some of the reductions in grants that will happen um, specifically 
on the departments of which I had responsibility, have responsibility for and uh, had responsibility for as well. But what I would say is that the priorities of this government are funded. So education reform is funded inside this budget. Healthcare reform is funded inside of uh, this budget. Uh, the security services are funded inside of this budget. So the priorities for the government are uh, funded. But there are going to have to be some reductions and some discontinuations of various programs in order to meet these funding targets which have been put in place. And I will let the minister speak to that. But I do not believe that what you're going to see is cuts in financial assistance. No, we are going to maintain the support of which we've had uh, to the people of this country. I do not believe you're going to see cuts in health care provisions. No, because we are going to continue the uh, the desire to make sure we provide for the most vulnerable. You're not going to see cuts in our support to our seniors um, and those services, and you're also not going to see uh, cuts in regards to health services and or education. So there are difficult choices that were made in this budget from various ministers, but in regards to across the board cuts or severe austerity, that is not something in which you'll find in this budget. It is a difficult spending line that ministers have to hold, especially given that the one year um, increases came out of the budget last year. So those freezes, et cetera, carried on. So the persons who are working, we had to absorb those uplifts, uplifts into our budgets. So that has been a very difficult uh, task for all ministers to make sure they achieve. But I do not believe what you're going to see are uh, significant across the board cuts. There are going to be targeted changes and there may be some services and programs that may be discontinued and ministers will certainly speak to those. So you're still not giving any details of the cuts today. And also on Friday, you didn't give any details of um, the GenCom deal, the proposed GenCom deal over the Southampton Princess. Um, when will they come? Can you give any today? And was part of your disagreement with Curtis Dickinson, who resigned just a few days before the budget, over the um, over the uh, the statement of financial position, the FSF? SFP on that deal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connolly. Let me try just to go back to your previous question because I want to state uh, specifically what I had stated inside of the uh, budget uh, statement. It says, Mr. Speaker, the $945 million of card expenditure for the next fiscal year will still require a significant amount of reduction in services in order to meet that target. Cabinet ministers will detail these measures during the Committee of Supply. The reductions can be seen across the board where grants have been reduced in certain areas, service will have to be limited, and hiring will be frozen. This $945 million is an accurate baseline for future card account spending, but it will still require significant spending discipline in order to ensure that this budget target was met. And so I just wanted to state um, what, was, what was given uh, to the public in that regard. Uh, because it is going to require spending discipline. And I think the government has been has a record of spending discipline, which we've had over the years uh, since the, we've been returned to office, and we will continue with that record of spending discipline. Um, in regards to the Fairmont Southampton uh, uh, project, uh, there was no specifics that were given inside the budget statement because there were no specifics to give at that point in time. But what I did lay out in the budget statement was the construct in which we must view hotel development in Bermuda. Hotel development in Bermuda, we have to be competitive. Bermuda is an expensive jurisdiction from which to operate from, an expensive jurisdiction in which to um, develop, an expensive jurisdiction in which to operate. And it was important that we set out the challenge in which we face. If Bermuda's economy, from the tourism perspective, is to return to a place of where it creates, plays an even greater role of employment in our economy, rather than international business, which is overtaking tourism for the first time as the largest employment sector in Bermuda, then we have to recognize that we must be competitive with other jurisdictions who are offering greater concessions than we offer here in Bermuda. Other governments have recognized that having significant investment in hotels, which are long-term investments, which create long-term jobs and long-term economic activity, is better than the short-term direct taxation, which may come from the operation of these hotels. And so that is the process of which we set out. In regards to disagreements and on this matter, I'm not going to comment on that further than what we stated inside of uh, the budget statement. And that was that the former Minister of Finance did agree in 2019 with GenCom for the provision of a $50 million guarantee for the support of this project. Things have changed since 2019, certainly. Supply chain issues and other things have changed. And but we're going to make sure that we deliver a deal 
that has the best interests of the country in mind and holds true to the things of which we've laid out in 2019, which are to make sure that we protect the public purse, but also recognize that we must have hotel development. And the largest private employer in the country and the largest hotel in the country needs to be supported in order to make sure that it can be reopened. So people are still in the dark about where the cuts are going to fall then. Um, there was provision in the budget for COVID. You attended Founders Day on Sunday and then you tested positive Sunday evening on an antigen, unfortunately. Um, I've been there, I know it's a horrible thing. Um, uh, when were the other people attending that event warned that you had tested positive in this way? Um, thank you. As per the health regulations, I inform my close contacts um, immediately, uh, because that is the way in which we uh, go about it. And then the party um, uh, was uh, contacting other persons who are not considered close contacts and casual contacts in the way of which um, those uh, matters are handled. Uh, so certainly my immediate close contacts were informed. Anyone who I had been in touch with over the past uh, few days uh, were certainly informed. Um, and so that was handled uh, yesterday. You spoke to my colleague, Jonathan Bell, face to face at that event. He was not contacted. He then came into the office yesterday unaware that you had tested positive after he had spoken to you face to face. He could have infected if he had been infected by you. He could have then infected the whole office. He wasn't contacted. Isn't that irresponsible by you? Um, I'm not going to speak to whether it was responsible or not, but you are correct. I did speak to Jonathan outside the event. I was talking about inside the event, so that was an oversight on my behalf. I'm happy to reach out to him, but thank you for reminding me. You don't think it's irresponsible then of you not to inform him he could have infected the whole office? Mr. Conley, I did say that I was talking about the people that were at the event, inside the event. You are it correct. I did, you are correct that I did speak to Mr. Jonathan Bell before the event. It was an oversight. Um, I thank you for reminding me, and I'm certain that that will be relayed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Conley. Those are your questions. And we will take questions now. Oh, from Trevor Lindsay of TNN. Good day. Hello, Hello. Trevor, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, yes, thank you. Thank you for the invite. Um, my first question, I'm glad Mr. Conley touched on the Founders Day. On the Founders Day, I, I totally understand. TNN, uh, my first question, I'm glad Mr. Conley touched on the Founders Day. Founders Day, I, I totally understand. Trevor, can you, Trevor, can you please turn down your... Yeah, I just, I just done that. TNN Thank understands you. that some 12 members, uh, 12 individuals that were said that Founders Day function uh, has tested positive. When will the party uh, speak of these, um, these individuals? Uh, Trevor, what I can say is that that is news and information to me, so I cannot uh, state anything. All I can say is that the matters um, are being followed uh, by the uh, protocols which are laid out by the Ministry of Health, and you're certainly welcome uh, to speak uh, to the party further on this. I'm trying to make sure I remain focused on budget matters. So I can't necessarily speak uh, to uh, that, and I certainly do not believe that number is correct in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Um, and if, okay. if that is the case, that has not been brought to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Um, can you update, what could be the sticking points to the deal at the Southampton process negotiations, and when will a deal be finalized? Um, well, Trevor, I uh, spent uh, sat Sunday morning at 9 a.m. I had a meeting on Fairmont Southampton. Uh, yesterday, uh, there were three meetings on the Fairmont Southampton project. Uh, what we are continuing to work through are the contours of this deal to ensure that the interests of the government of Bermuda on behalf of the people of Bermuda are protected, while making sure that we get a hotel development up and running uh, that will provide significant employment in construction and long-term employment um, after the hotel property opens. I'm not necessarily going to go into sticking points. Um, I don't think that it is helpful to go into the details of what may or may not happen. Uh, the government, uh, there are further calls scheduled uh, later today. Lawyers have been working around the clock uh, for the last two weeks and trying to make sure that various matters are ironed out. 
There's also a conversation with overseas lenders between the government of Bermuda, in addition to local lenders. But the project as it is constructed right now is seeing uh, $220 million of overseas funding uh, being put into uh, the, uh, the development, which is something significant because hotel projects to date have only seen local funding from uh, local banks. $222 million of overseas funding uh, from a debt perspective, um, about $100 million of equity, which is being contributed by the uh, team, and $75 million of local uh, debt that is being provided to deal. It's a significant deal. We're talking about the total uh, capitalization price of this deal is right now budgeted at $376.2 million. It is a significant deal. And so to make sure a significant deal works, we're going to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Um, we are working to get it done, and it is my hope that we will be able to announce it as soon as possible, but I'm not going to handicap that or give specific regards. If we're talking about the sticking points, it's making sure that the government of Bermuda is protected so that in any case and instance, we do not end up by the situation that the former government put us in place in, which was at Morgan's Point, where we're guaranteeing the entirety of the portion of that debt. There is nothing uh, that will be any similar way in that but whatever portion that we are uh, providing guarantee for, we need to make sure that there are the requisite provisions in place for the governor of Utah to be protected. Thank you, sir. And a question on the finance department, finance ministry. How long can I ask, was Van Ferbert or is Van Ferbert and Dushay Adams been a consultant in the finance department? And were they partially the cause of Curtis Dickinson's register? resignation uh, due to body heads and a lot of disagreements? Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure where that question came from. Uh, MP Adams um, has been in, in uh, assistant to the Minister of Finance, I wanna say for the last two years, and that's been declared um, inside of statements in the House of Assembly and in public declarations. So that's uh, not new. Um, MP Ferbert uh, does not serve, sorry, Minister Ferbert, does not serve um, in the Ministry of Finance. However, he was junior minister of finance when I was minister of finance the first time around. And I asked for Minister Ferber to come and assist me in getting the budget finalized, the budget statement finalized and the things for the budget finalized um, uh, when I took over the role a uh, week before last. So um, I, I'm not entirely certain as to the uh, basis of the questions. Um, I would say that MP Adams uh, certainly has done a significant amount of work and I'm grateful for his efforts and I'm grateful for the help that MP Ferber, oh, sorry, Minister Ferber was able to lend at the uh, last minute um, as we got this budget statement done in record time uh, to make sure that we can make a full presentation uh, to the country, uh, complete with graphs and charts to, uh, to visualize what it was that the country was currently going through and experiencing. Thank you, and my last question. Uh, as we all know, the debt, Bermuda's debt sits at $3 billion. How long will this administration, or is it realistic that you can bring the debt down within a uh, four or five year period? Is it possible? If we refer to um, the budget statement on page 28, one of the things that the fiscal responsibility panel said is that the government in this budget should set out a forward path to make it to a 50 uh, million dollar budget surplus by the fiscal year 2026-2027. We met that recommendation that is provided there. We are expected that the budget will be um, in a surplus by 2024-2025. At that point in time, our net debt will begin to reduce. But the most important thing that we need to do is make sure that we balance the budget. That's the key point. And we need to make sure that we support economic growth because as the economy grows, if our debt remains the same or shrinks, that is a healthy indicator. And that is where we're planning to get to. So is it realistic to eliminate $3 billion of debts in a year or two or three? No, that is not realistic. But is it realistic to say that we will get to a balanced budget in the time of which we have now specified and also be able to uh, start reducing that debt? Absolutely. That was the targets that we had set when we first came into office. We understand that Morgan's point in the pandemic set that back. But we are now back on that path. Our revenues are strong, as we've seen. There are areas of growth inside of our business uh, communities, such as international travel. The redevelopment of the Fairmont Southampton and additional hotel projects will certainly see hotel and tourism employment begin to increase again, and we can reverse some of these trends. So we are confident that we'll be able to meet the long-term projections of which have been set out in page 28 of the budget and see us returning to a surplus 
in the budget year of 2024-25 and making it to a $50 million uh, budget surplus by 2026-27. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Thank, Thank you. Hopefully there's more time to come back around. Sure. Thanks. Um, Premier, we'll now take questions from Mayor Palacio of Media Maya. She's just connecting now, Premier. Maya? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, we can hear you. Like everyone, I wish the Premier a swift recovery, as well as anyone on the island who is currently with COVID at the moment. I wish everyone a swift recovery. My first question to you, Premier. Now, as the Premier, you have a role as being the person who tells us what we can try to make happen more like the yes politician almost on the island, if I may say. But as the Minister of Finance, that's more of a no position. We kind of have to be firm on things that we can and cannot accomplish and what deficits that we have to make and cuts you have to make. Now, as a fellow colleague in here, journalism just stated from the Gazette, um, Sean, I believe it was, he mentioned that you weren't necessarily telling us exactly what cuts were being made and you were leaving it to the ministers to speak to that fully. Now, can you give some perspective as to how, you know, being the premier and also the minister of finance, how those two um, positions might actually clash in you being kind of straightforward and just telling us exactly what the cuts are because you're leaving it to the ministry or the ministers. Uh, thank you. Um, and Maya, I think that gives an opportunity for me to explain how the budget process actually works. So the former Minister of Finance started this year and we introduced a full zero based budgeting process where all ministries and all ministers are responsible for putting together their budgets. Those budget submissions then go to the Ministry of Finance and the Minister of Finance reviews those matters with myself as the Premier, the leader of the cabinet, to identify what budget priorities need to be funded. And if there's extra and excess money from the zero-based budgeting process, where do those uh, monies go? And to set out the overall perspective. I don't actually believe that there is a great conflict between uh, the Premier and Minister of Finance. There are many Caribbean countries where the Premier is the Minister of Finance as well. Barbados is one uh, particular example where me and Motley serves both places, Turks and Caicos and others. This is not an unusual construct. And from the perspective of where we are working, there allows that synergy to ensure that the priorities of the government of Bermuda are certainly executed. I, I served as Premier and Minister of Finance uh, um, in 2017. I was happy to relinquish the role of Minister of Finance uh, to Curtis Dickinson, and I'm more than willing to uh, bring this back up again uh, now that uh, the uh, former Minister of Finance is elected uh, to sit on the back bench. But the budget process is done by uh, various ministers, and that is the way that the budget process has always been done. The Minister of Finance does not sit there and go through each and every single budget. It is a responsibility of ministers to put together their budgets and where there are conflicts, where there is a question of, okay, we can either fund this or this, which are the ones of which we're going to fund. That is where the debate comes between uh, the Premier and uh, various ministers of government. And we did see some of those debates, making sure that we arrive at these particular spending targets. But we will recognize that there were some areas that needed additional funding such as the Ministry of Finance in dealing with the um, challenges on the international sphere and, uh, and, and such as the Ministry of Health, of course, absor absorbing all of the coronavirus budgets into uh, their uh, particular ministry. So I don't view it as a conflict per se. Um, I think that it works well in certain countries, but I think what is important to note is that the Minister of Finance, the former Minister of Finance, was very good when it came to spending discipline. And in my time as Minister of Finance, I've already let my ministers know that that spending discipline cannot disappear. The reason that spending discipline cannot disappear is that we have said that we are going to return any additional surpluses to the people this year in the form of reductions in energy duty, which will reduce the cost of electricity. And if we are, if we are not holding uh, uh, firm on our spending numbers, and if we then say, oh, we can afford to spend more because our revenues are up, that means that we will return less money to the people of this country. So the spending discipline will continue. And I intend to um, make sure that the government continues 
to meet its budget targets and continues to stay ahead of this debt trajectory as that's essential to refinance our debt and move forward. So to answer your question, I do not believe that there is a big conflict and it's important that we understand how the budget process is done. It is done at a ministry by ministry level and fed into the Ministry of Finance who is responsible for compiling the overall budgets. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, my next question for you, coming from the younger generation on the island, uh, you did note in the budget that you, you will be furthering the pension removal for another year. And a lot of conversations, if you've tapped into any of the burn memes, tweets, and conversations with um, Bermuda Youth Connect, um, a lot of the general conversation was about why young people should even come back home after graduating. What's the purpose if, like, obviously our pension is depleting and things are getting a little worrisome for our generation, whether or not there even is going to be one if we keep raising the age where you can retire, we'll be working till probably till we're like 75 at this point. So can you give me some like reassurance, some examples or even reasons as to why the young people should actually come back to assist and work on this island when we're already losing so many jobs already and there's like people depleting in the job opportunities here on the island? Well, let me answer that question in two ways. Number one, uh, Maya, I was a young person uh, once um, and I don't know when I uh, faced the decision and choice of whether to move back to the island in 2003. Um, I made the decision based upon my personal circumstances and I made uh, the choice to return uh, back uh, to Bermuda. It's a personal choice uh, for many. Some people return right after school. Other people uh, decide to get experience and return um, at another point in time. But one of the things I will say is that from a job perspective, we have seen that there is strength in certain job markets. And the challenge in Bermuda is that we still have more jobs and there are Bermudians able to fill those jobs. I can look at my tourism hats and know that the Minister of Labor, working with the Tourism Authority and the Bermuda Hotel Association, did a very large labor fair or job fair in the hotel industry in December. And there were multiple roles that were not able to be filled by residents. And the fact is that we do know that with the progressive policies from the Ministry of Labor, in setting out the closed and restricted categories to ensure that Bermudians get back into the workforce, those are bearing fruit. So I do not accept that there are not jobs. The Ministry of Labor has been very keen on protecting uh, the Bermudian workforce. And the fact is that there are still more jobs in Bermuda than there are Bermudians to fill those roles. And we are committed to ensuring that Bermudians are not only able to fill those roles, but have additional training if there is additional training that is required in order to fill those roles. On to the question of which you mentioned about pensions, it is a difficult question. And pensions in Bermuda are no different than pensions around the world. And so in our 2017 election manifesto, we did say that the retirement age will have to increase. We did say that we we're going to continue to provide uh, increases for pensions for our senior citizens, but we need to make sure that our pensions are sustainable. Our pensions become sustainable in two ways. Number one, you have more people paying into the pension fund, which means that the more people who are taking out of the pension fund is balanced. And that's why economic growth is important. That's why it's important to get the Fairmont Southampton property back up and running and operating and to see a rebound in tourism growth to complement the growth of which we're seeing in international business jobs. But from an overall perspective, we have to do the work which many other countries have done over the past 15 years in making sure that pensions can be sustainable for the future. We must accomplish that. That is not something that this government will shirk away from. It is a very I would say difficult task, but there is going to have to be an increase in the age of where people receive benefits. There is going to have to be changes to how our social insurance receive this contribution. And there are going to have to be those adjustments which are made, but we are going to make those adjustments. We've started with the consultation process and whether it's with Bermuda Youth Connect, whether it's your platform and others, I'm happy to speak about those issues because these are not new. I mean, persons in the United Kingdom will know that these are the changes to which have already been made where it's the increase in retirement age, the increase in contributions, et cetera. Those things are necessary when people are living longer to make sure pensions can be there for the future. But the government is committed to ensuring that pensions will be there for the future. And that will be the plan of which we lay out. Thank you very much. My last question for you. Obviously there has to have been some project approvals for the fiscal year coming up. 
And I want to know if you could share the most expensive project that is actually being worked on in Bermuda right now and how much that'll take out of the taxpayers. Uh, thank you, um, Maya. If we can look at page, I would go to page 24 of the budget statement. It speaks to the capital expenditure uh, this year. And our capital expenditure budget this year is set at $73 million. $51 million of that is for capital development. This is building of uh, new buildings and items. Or, you know, the and then $21 million is for capital acquisitions. Capital acquisitions are for things such as uh, buses, ferries, uh, computer equipment, those type of investments. So out of uh, this, um, it is divided uh, between uh, 51 and a half for, I would say, capital expenditure and 21 and a half uh, for uh, capital acquisitions. Uh, the biggest item in capital development this year is going to be the refurbishment and work that is going to be done at the Times Bay facility. And there is $7 million that is for the Times Bay facility. Interestingly enough, uh, the uh, next uh, largest matter is to deal with affordable housing um, and works dealing with affordable housing. And the third largest uh, matter is actually uh, the money to pay off the loan for Cross Island, which is about $5 million uh, this uh, year. So that's not actually capital development that's going to be spent this year, but that's paying off um, existing loans. But the biggest capital development expense this year will be uh, the work that is going to be taking place at the Tynes Bay Waste to Energy Facility this year. Um, one last question, just to follow up on that, if I can. Sorry. Mm -hmm. no Thank you. Um, when it comes to the capital development, uh, you did say new buildings, but that would that also be reflected to old buildings that have been like really decrepit and just sitting there in Bermuda? Like, for example, the arcade that's supposed to be on Devil's Island Town, like it's just been sitting there empty, not really doing anything, and it's kind of a kind of an important landmark, I think, like it's in a good space area in town. So. Would anything be going or happening with that space in particular? Out of curiosity? Um, from the government perspective, no, because that's not a government property. So in capital development, we're talking about government properties and government development. So capital development, as you call, will be Times Bay. Capital development will be the $3 million of which we have the upgrade and refurbishment of schools. Capital development would be uh, road works and other types of things. It's specifically dealing with the government estate and uh, government items, not necessarily private sector items. What's important is from the private sector is to make sure that you stimulate development in the private sector. Some of the changes of which we made in 2019 helped to do work to stimulate uh, development in the city of Hamilton. Uh, the Minister of Economy and Labor um, is now my economic development responsibilities, which I once held, um, have now been transferred to uh, Minister Jason Hayward. He will be speaking more about those matters either in the House of Assembly this Friday or going forward about the economic recovery plan initiatives to actually construct more affordable housing in the city of Hamilton. Those things have progressed and I'm happy to um, either with him or either with the BEDC, um, I think it will be a really good platform for you and your uh, listeners and readers to see what the plans are for uh, North Hamilton and to provide uh, more affordable housing for uh, young people specifically, as I think that is one of the greatest barriers. It's a big barrier for me when I wanted to move back home after living away, not wanting to move back into my parents' home. And I'm sure that's a consideration for many persons when they look to come back to Bermuda, whether or not there's a place that can be affordable for them to stay. We have to recognize that we have to change the paradigm in which exists, understanding that some of the constructs of which we've had in the past don't necessarily work. And these protections of which we've had in our economy where people who come into our country who work in our country are told to not invest their money in this country and take that money and invest it somewhere has been to our detriment. We've spoken about these things, this budget statement. Our failures are things that I'll expand on. I know you and I have a sit down session later uh, this week uh, to go ahead and expand on these. And I look forward to expanding on those topics when we speak further. Thank you very much, Mr. Premier. And I look forward to speaking to you on Thursday. Thank you, Ms. Palacio. Premier, we have actually gone over uh, a lot of time. Um, so I don't know if you want to take more questions or just try to find those parting words. Uh, my, my response were kind of long. So if everyone's around, I'll happily take one more round of questions. One more round? Okay, yes, let's, let's start that. with um, Mr. Skelton. He's still here. Gary? Hello, Gary, we can see you, thank you. Hello, good, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Premier. Um, so one more round of questions. Now, 
a couple of weeks ago, we weren't expecting to have this conversation post budget with you. Um, now, neither you nor Curtis Dickinson have explained the reason why he left cabinet. Do you not think that the public has a right to know the reason? And was the Fairmont Southampton guarantee a pivotal point of contention? I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of people that are fixated on this point. I think mm -hmm. that it's important to note that, as I stated in the budget statement, uh, that the former Minister of Finance set out the constructs of which the guarantee would be provided to Fairmont Southampton in 2019. So those matters are a matter of public record, so I don't want to get into that. Um, I'm not going to speak as to whether uh, the reasons why I had a very cordial conversation with the former Minister of Finance, but we continue to remain in touch and he said that he will be able to assist and lend um, his advice on matters as we move forward. And so I don't, the fact is that cabinet ministers leave for a number of reasons. I know how difficult this work is, uh, certainly on persons and for family. Um, and so I'm not going to uh, necessarily comment on that. I'm not entirely certain uh, what uh, benefit that will have. The facts are that the Minister of Finance um, has elected to sit in the back bench. The government has continuity. Uh, the roles are being picked up um, uh, by myself. Um, and certain other ministers will continue to uh, push forward the agenda of the government. Governments were elected to execute their election manifestos. And I hold firm of the view that we must press forward with the promises of which we made uh, to the country. This cabinet will continue to do that. And we're going to push forward the ideals uh, which are stated inside the Ministry of Finance. There's a number of things that are inside the Ministry of Finance's uh, throne speech uh, commitments, which remain undone. And in my time as Minister of Finance, whether it be long or short, I intend to make sure that we advance those things, provide the relief uh, which are necessary. We've been speaking about mortgage relief uh, for a very long time. Those matters need to be brought to conclusion. We've been speaking about additional domestic pension investments which needs to be made available. We're going to bring those matters to conclusion. And we've been speaking about banking conduct for a while and to make sure that there are limits and fees and other things which we've been speaking of since the Progressive Labor Party was in opposition. And we're going to bring those things to fruition. So we're going to execute on the matters of which we set out in our election manifesto. And the fact is, whether it's me as a minister of finance, whether it's someone else the minister of finance, whether it's me as a leader of the government or someone else the leader of the government, whether it's various ministers that exist, the progressive Labour Party will execute its election pledges. That is what we set out to do, and that is what we will continue to do at all points in time. Thank you, Mr. Premier, and I wish you a speedy and full recovery. Um, as you can see, I'm doing quite well right now. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the wishes, though. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Skelton. And we'll take one more question now from Mr. Connolly at the World Gazette. Hello, Mr. Connolly. We can see you, but we can't hear you. You're still on mute. Mr. Connolly, you're still on mute. Hello, sorry about that. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can All hear right. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Premier, um, eyewitnesses said you got a pretty lukewarm response at Founders Day on Sunday. You've provided, you've presided over a string of mishaps and you've managed to lose your finance minister, one of the most respected finance ministers the island's had, um, just days before the budget. Do you expect a leadership challenge at the PLP? delegates conference in October and if there is one how confident of you are winning on a scale from one to ten ten being excellent um Mr Connolly today's uh press conference is focused on the budgets and I'm not entirely certain um about whatever uh comments you would have had I think that the founders Day event was a great event which highlighted um the contributions of which many people in this uh, country have made um also um announcing of an education award in the name of Dame uh, Jennifer Smith, and um, it was great to have persons uh, back in the room in person. So we'll press on. I'm not going to prejudge what may or may not happen in October. All I know is that I continue to serve as a leader of the Progressive Labour Party, and we are all committed to executing on our election pledges, and that we is what this party is committed to do, the members of this party are committed to do, all members of caucus are committed to do, and we'll push uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. And thank you, Premier. That does conclude a press conference. I will give you an opportunity to say a few words before we end. 
Uh, thank you, Ms. Adams. I thank members of the media for their questions. Certainly, there'll be more engagements which are going to be taking place on budget matters uh, throughout this week. I would encourage all persons to go ahead and read the budget statement online uh, to get their copy to understand. Feel free to ask questions at any point in time. We'll be doing, as I said, engagements with uh, Burn News, Media Maya, um, other uh, platforms. Uh, as we go forward, numerous radio interviews and the ministers will be presenting their various budget items as we go forward. This budget was delivered in order to make sure that we provide relief. We have a contract which has been set out to take Bermuda to a balanced budget. And we are also going to make sure that any excess money of which the government takes on, we're going to provide at least 50% of that money to the citizens in the form of tax relief and reductions of duty uh, to energy costs to reduce the cost of energy in this country. We are proud of this budget, which has been laid. It has been laid. It sets a foundation for growth. And as we go forward, it is important that all of us play a part in ensuring that Bermuda's economic recovery can be strong. And I look forward to continuing to work with all the ministers of the government and all of the very dedicated public officers throughout the public service in implementing the pledges and policies which have been set out in this budget to provide relief to people now, to provide relief later, and also to set a path for economic recovery for this country. Thank you, Ms. Adams, and I look forward to further engagements with the people of this country in the days to come. Thank you, Mr. Premier. That concludes today's press conference.